because disruptive mood dysregulation is a brand new condition, DSM-5, in April of 2013, invented this new disorder, and there is no accepted treatment strategy for this condition, none. So everybody has to figure out what to do for themselves. And when you're in a situation like that, the only thing they really can do is you can go to experts. And I am an expert in disruptive mood disorders. In fact, all I've seen for the last 20 years are children and adolescents with disruptive mood disorders. And before I entered psychiatry, I worked in traumatic brain injury. I'm a neuropsychologist. And individuals who have traumatic brain injury sometimes develop chronic neurobehavioral disorders, disorders that are very disruptive and, dis and difficult. And one of the worst and most difficult is aggression, pathological, unresponsive to treatment aggression. And so I worked with a lot of children and adolescents who had been in car accidents or had concussions from football or had some tumors or had some bleeding in the brain or had some disease which affected their brain in such a way that they ended up with chronic and very difficult to manage aggression, explosive aggression. And if you haven't dealt with explosive aggression, it, it is a phenomenon to behold. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of it later. So I started doing that. In fact, let me give you a little background. You, you, you heard that I'm from, I got my PhD from New York University. I'm obviously a Yankee. I have a little bit of a New York accent. You can hear that. <laughs> I, my wife is from Memphis, so that's how we ended up in the South, because she wanted to go South, and she's right. The snow out there is bad. This is much nicer, even though it's a little bit cold today, it's much nicer here. <clears throat> and I've been here 25 years in Texas, and I love it. Uh, we live in Austin, <clears throat> and the situation is that I, I started my career as a psychologist, and then I went and took a master's degree in clinical and then a PhD in clinical neuropsychology. So I started specializing in psychology, neuropsychology. Took my internship at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Department of Neuropsychology and got interested in children, children and adolescents. And so I took a two-year postdoc in pediatric neuropsychology. So now I am not just a psychologist, I'm not just a neuropsychologist, I'm now a pediatric neuropsychologist. And over the years, I've ended up specializing only in pathologically violent children. So I know a lot more about less and less. And pretty soon, I'm going to know everything about nothing, is what I figure, if I keep this up. <laughs> but in about 20 years ago, I was recruited to come to Texas because I did specialize as a psychologist. Not, not, I don't prescribe medicine, but as a psychologist in the management of pathologically violent juveniles. And they are very hard to manage and not, not only crisis management, but also behavioral management and psychotherapy and things you do that are psychosocial, not just medication. Um, and he had a medical director here, was a neuropsychiatrist, who was a specialist in the medication for this problem. And we had a neurologist here in San Antonio, maybe you know him, Dr. Seal, John Seals, who uh, is a specialist in the brain problems associated with uh, violent juveniles. And so we put together a program specifically for this population, disruptive mood disorders in children and adolescents. And that's all we've been seeing. We have a facility in just north of Austin with 120 beds that is devoted to this population. And they're full all the time. <laughs> and if you think it's difficult to manage one disruptive mood disorder with an explosive child, try 120 of them in a confined space. Now, of course, we're a locked facility because it's dangerous to leave them out. And also, also a medical model facility with 24-hour nurse, nursing. And we've cornered the market on child adolescent psychiatry. We have five, <coughs> three full-time, two part-time child adolescent psychiatrists on staff. So we do nothing, pretty much, in the neurobehavioral part, part, department but this type of kid, the kid that comes in. Now, we are a residential treatment center. So these are children who have failed in treatment, outpatient, intensive outpatient, um, multiple, they've had on average four psychiatric hospitalizations and they're still having the same problem. They've done all kinds of medications. These are failed treatment and the, this is a very difficult condition to treat successfully. 
And so there's an awful lot of individuals who are failed in treatment and uh, end up uh, applying to come to us. <clears throat> and there has been no name for this condition. Psychiatrists made up a name. <laughs> they called it bipolar disorder childhood version. <laughs> It became a diagnosis du jour. Every, every irritable child became bipolar disorder. But they, they don't meet the criteria necessarily, but they're children and they're explosive and they're irritable, so they're bipolar disorder. Well, turns out that's not the case. It turns out that's not true that they have bipolar disorder. And for 10 years, we see, we've seen an explosion of the diagnosis of bipolar in chronically irritable children who really don't have bipolar disorder. <clears throat> and their condition doesn't turn into bipolar. It's not even an early onset of something that's gonna become bipolar disorder. So, but that's the diagnosis that was used a lot. We didn't agree with that. Most people that I know were skeptical about that. And so many people diagnosed mood disorder NOS. <clears throat> they didn't know what else to do. They, they weren't quite bipolar, but they certainly had some kind of a mood disorder, but they didn't know what to call it, so they called it mood disorder. And we did not have a label for this condition. You know, let me excuse my fast talking. I'm from New York, that's, I can't get rid of that. The accent is much less than it used to be, <laughs> but I can't stop the fast talk. <clears throat> By the way, if you have any questions, please ask the questions. I'm here to answer your questions, more important than the slides. In fact, you have the handouts that you can take it home, but I want you to be able to ask questions. I am an expert, and there are very few experts. You know how many people are interested in spending their life with nothing but violent juveniles? <laughs> I have parents who don't want to spend their lives anymore with them these violent juveniles. It's, uh, it's not a pretty sight, and, but I can go into any school, anywhere in the country, I can go into any mental health facility, anywhere in the country, any psychiatric hospital, anywhere in the country, and I guarantee you, there's a failed treatment <laughs> with this condition, that you're gonna find this condition everywhere. It is the condition that has been eating up and frustrating uh, our mental health services. But it's not rare. It's not, it's not rare at all. In fact, it's more common than bipolar disorder. More common and harder to, harder to treat, and there's no treatment strategies that have been accepted, none. So you're stuck unless you come to see me because I'm the expert. There are experts elsewhere. They're not necessarily, the, they don't do the same thing we do, but experts differ. Until we have placebo-controlled standard treatment experiments, until we have the, you know, the usual gold standard of, um, of studies to say what works, we don't have that. We have, not, we have very little studies. This just came out, this diagnosis just came out. So there's very little research. Uh, until we have the, that research to say this is what works, this is the treatment you should use, and you, you really need to go to, to, to experts, and experts differ. And so what you're getting is a professional opinion. By the way, I have a disclaimer. I don't know how many of you are medical, but my disclaimer is I do talk about medicines because I'm opinionated. No expertise, just opinions. Beware, when I speak about medicines, I've heard about it because we have a lot of psychiatrists and I've been working with them for 20 years and I'll tell you what I think, but it's just an opinion because <laughs> uh, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. It's a well-informed opinion, but it's nevertheless an opinion. I, I want you to recognize that, okay. But ask all the questions you want about that. I'm happy to answer questions as long as you recognize my disclaimer. All right. So <laughs> let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about, what kind of patients I'm talking about. First of all, before I even talk, I, I got a letter yesterday, and I, th this letter is the reason I'm not retired yet. <laughs> my wife has been after me for 10 years. And I said, I love these children. She says, what's so loving about violent kids? Why, why do you love them so much? I said, well, I grew up in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, there's nothing but violent kids, everywhere, you know, gangs, everything. I, mean, I grew up in nothing but violent kids, and I hated them. I didn't like those violent kids because they were mean. These children are sick puppies. They are not mean. This is a whole different kind of violence. This is not mean people. These are just sick. And when they respond to treatment and they get better, it is a joy. And it's a joy to me. It's what makes me, you know, get up in the morning and go to work. And it's a and this letter, letter from this family. These letters it would keep me going. And she says, and this mother wrote this letter. 
She says, I brought, I brought my 10-year-old girl to, you, to your facility with very few hopes left because she had gone everywhere and done everything and had, nothing had worked. Since the age of seven, this beautiful child, this wonderful, sweet little girl, turned into the Incredible Hulk four or five times a week, blowing up and assaulting her family, her siblings, her parents, next door neighbor, peers at school. She, took a, she, she had a, a, little, a little bit of an argument. These are assaults for really almost no reason at all. She got, she, the teacher criticized something, as teachers are prone to do, and she grabbed the pencil and, and a sharp pencil and stabbed her. She was extremely violent and very dangerous. And of course, she went through therapies. Therapies did nothing. She went through intensive outpatient therapy that did not do anything. She went into, she had on average, on average six psychiatric hospitals per year for the three years prior to coming to us. So the mother basically had figured, what have I got to lose? One more try, you know, we heard that you specialize in this, you know, but she didn't really expect too much. <clears throat> and, and I don't say that all our cases are gonna be like this, but I'm saying that this is the kind of case we see. And she comes in and for three years, she says she didn't have a daughter. She had this, this incredible Hulk, this Jekyll and Hyde that, that would come down to breakfast and be happy and all of a sudden didn't have the pancake that she wanted and would blow up and throw the table over and assault the mother and was just out of control for an hour, an hour or two. Ended up, she had to call the police on a six-year-old. If you have to call the police to restrain a six-year-old, you know you have a very sick child. Um, because this is not an adolescent with muscles, this is a little child. And by the way, don't ever underestimate the strength of a child with this condition. They will be 10 times stronger than normal. You will be really surprised how strong they get and how violent they become. Um, it, it, it's as if they're fighting for their lives. It's that kind of fer ferocious violence. Um, and also, if you do work with them and you're a mental health professional and you develop a relationship, great. That's what you're trained to do. You develop this wonderful relationship. You need to do that, of course. But as soon as they become violent, that relationship is gone. You no longer have that relationship. You now have the Incredible Hulk, who has no relationship with anybody and you cannot talk to this person. There's nobody home. <laughs> There's nobody home, trust me. And you're having to deal with something very strong, very ferocious, who you cannot talk to. All that you've learned about crisis management, forget it, does not work with this population. I will teach you crisis management for this particular population, and you'll understand it. Before. This is the second hour. The first hour, we're gonna talk about what is it, basically. I want you to understand it from my point of view, as I understand it. And then the second hour will be, what do you do about it? How do we treat it? And that's what's been working for us and we're gonna share that with you so you can know what we're doing as experts. Um, you may find experts elsewhere have a different, different opinion, different strategy. And almost every child that comes to us is loaded up with antipsychotic medication because that's kind of this, the medication du jour, just like the diagnosis du jour. But it's not no longer necessary because they're not bipolar that you use bipolar medicines. And it's very sedating. There are some significant side effects, some problems with it, and I'm not sure that it really is necessary. We're not necessarily treating the underlying condition with antipsychotic medication. It's sedating. In fact, some of the kids come in like this drooling, they can't even hold their head up from antipsychotic medication. <clears throat> but they almost always come in on it, and so we have to take, the first thing we've got to do is get them off of that, because that is not a treatment, that's a sedation from our perspective, if this is the diagnosis. So it's a whole different perspective. But when you take them off the sedation, be prepared for a little wild person to come out because that's, that's the only thing that's been holding them together. So, or sometimes they come in, the police will come in, they're in handcuffs. If they're lucky, they've gone through psychiatry. If they're unlucky, they've gone into, you know, into detention or jail or juvenile justice. And same kind of restraint, it's just slightly unluckier if you end up in jail. <clears throat> so this is the kind of population we're talking about. Very difficult one, very few people specialize. Not only do they not specialize, but once you get one, you're stuck. You're a teacher, if you're a mental health person, <laughs> this is your patient, you've got him. This person is gonna potentially assault you and destroy your office 
for no particular reason, or because you said something, or maybe you touched on a little you know, nerve or a frustration, or you're, you're, a te you're a psychologist, you're doing tests, and this test, for some reason, is irritating, <laughs> annoying, frustrating. We love to get frustrating tests, you know. And click. And when I say click, I mean it's that fast. Click. Well, this person, which was a perfectly normal looking person a moment ago, is now completely out of control. A wild, ferocious, and extremely dangerous person. Literally. You don't know how to manage that, you're going to get assaulted. And the family's been assaulted, and the teachers have been assaulted, and the peers and the siblings, they've all been assaulted. And they're all afraid of this child. And if you think there was a disruptive problem before, now, once you have this condition, you can be sure the family is now disrupted. The family is all, the teachers all know what to do with this child. Everyone is upset because it's a very difficult condition. So, <clears throat> I will teach you what you need to do to not be afraid. Because if you understand, you don't have to be afraid. You know exactly what to do. It's very simple. Well, I, have, I train all our staff so that they know what to do. And I train all over the country. That's, I'm spending, I travel everywhere, and I train people on how to do exactly what I'm gonna train you how to do after the first hour. These are behavioral problems, typically chronic, that are they, they, they're at least associated with brain. They're associated with brain. It doesn't mean that they're exactly caused by the brain or there's nothing but brain involved. There's certainly family issues. A lot of these kids have been abused. A lot of these kids have had been traumatized. There's all kinds of, of issues, disruptive families, all kinds of issues. But there's brain involved in somewhere. There's a brain problem in there somewhere.